I propose we start. And the first uh, speaker of the day, it's Hermann Schulz-Waldes. I don't think he needs any introduction. So oh, Hermann- to you, but some other day. people don't know me. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> thank, thanks. So- You think? Oh, I, uh, okay, so uh, here's my talk. Uh, in my title, it's about index theory and disordered insulators and semi-metals, and um, mainly joint work with Tom Stoiber, who is in the audience. And um, well, it's about, uh, so to say, the boring uh, side of topological insulators, namely the non-interacting ones. But on the other hand side, uh, we do deal with the situation where the gap is uh, not open. So we have a closed gap, um, namely we uh, deal with the mobility gap regime. And the second thing to, to advertise in this talk is that we feel we have interesting new results on index theory in, uh, for Neumann algebras. So maybe another part of the community is interested in that. So let's see. No, no I can't. There we are. Okay. So here's the plan of the talk. Um, I was asked to be, give a little bit of a review of uh, the importance and role of disorder, in particular in quantum Hall effect, but maybe also in other topological insulators. And uh, therefore, I will review a little bit what Anderson localization is and what one can prove and what one cannot prove. And then I'll go on to suppose that one has this Anderson localization and then uh, define weak invariants. And uh, the main result will then be um, uh, an index theorem with symbols which are taken from a Besov space. And um, there will be two applications. Uh, hopefully, I will get there. One, uh, which is to the delocalization of surface states. German, uh, it's possible you have to uh, unshare and share again because you changed something in your window. You, you, you have the impression you, you are okay, not Okay, so wait, thing. let's see. I'll, I'll do, no, I unshared it, yeah? Can you now this thing is sort of frozen up here. That's what it looked like. Can you see anything? Because I don't see anything anymore. No, my. So now we no, can see you. You, send, you see me? Now we see uh, everybody. But not, uh, so if you st start sharing again, geez, hopefully it works this time. <clears throat> can you see anything now? No, still. Yeah. Okay. So look, I'm going to maybe do the smaller view and uh, hope that that will go through. Uh, namely, don't go to the full screen mode. That happens now. Okay. We see again. Nicely visible. Okay. No, so yeah. let me stick with this, even though it's a little sure. bit small. smaller, okay? Um, so I, I was going to say that um, we have two applications of this uh, new index theorem. One is to the delocalization of surface states when the weak invariants in uh, these materials are non-trivial. And the second is to the about boundary correspondence in semi-metals, so which are not topological uh, insulators, but uh, which nevertheless do have some topological properties which lead to an interesting bulk boundary correspondence. So the main analytical tool that we use are um, Isov spaces. Um, well, in a generalized sense, namely for Rn actions uh, on a semi finite von Neumann algebra. And uh, in that framework, we were able to prove non commutative Peller criteria for the associated Hankel operators. So all this will be uh, sw swept under the carpet. And uh, if anybody is interested in this talk, uh, you can write me and I'll send you this uh, last reference here, which is the, the work with, uh, with Tom, um, which contains basically all the results that I, the new results that I'm going to talk about. Uh, I will also cite the, uh, some other references with Emil and one which is very old from my PhD thesis with Jean already. So let me start out with the um, quantum Hall effect. So now, I, the problem is that, uh, there we are, okay. So the integer quantum Hall effect uh, schematically uh, explained in just one slide is uh, the following thing. You have an uh, effectively two-dimensional electron 
gas in a strong magnetic field uh, perpendicular to the surface at uh, zero temperature, and uh, you are able to make a whole conductance measurement, namely you push the current through and measure the uh, tension to the perpendicular side of the sample uh, and get the conductance, the whole conductance, which is a macroscopic uh, quantity uh, in experiments. And you can argue on physical grounds that it's connected to the conductivity, uh, both in the bulk of the sample. So there's a Kubo formalism uh, to compute that and also to what we call the edge current uh, edge conductivity, which is computed by looking just at the surface physics of these samples. The experimental outcome can be schematically uh, represented as on the right slide here. I have the filling factor, which you can think of just as the particle density, um, which you can vary in the experiment by changing number of particle in this two dimensional system. And you measure the whole conductance, well, in units of E square uh, over, uh, over H. And uh, what you will get is for the whole conductance, the step-like curve. And uh, well, there are two things which are remarkable. First of all, that these steps are at integer values. So this indicates uh, an index theorem, which is behind that in the integer quantum Hall effect. And the second thing is uh, that these are very, very flat. And this is connected to the localization uh, and therefore the effects of the disorder. And without the disorder, you would not have these, uh, these plateaus. Okay, so um, of course, also this claim that you can't see the, uh, the quantum Hall effect uh, without disorder also holds through in the fractional quantum Hall effect, uh, but that's then at that stage, of course, a second order question. Good, so next thing uh, is I want to tell you how to model the uh, disorder. And I take really standard model, typically on uh, tight binding lattice uh, Hamiltonian. Uh, on, on a tight binding lattice Hilbert space. So an L2 over, let's say, immediately a D-dimensional lattice with a finite dimensional fiber, where you have a free operator, HB, which is like, could be like a magnetic operator with a periodic potential, for example, which is perturbed by a random operator with the coupling constant lambda in front. And the random part is of the following type. You have on site, uh, on every side N, sort of bumps, which are matrix valued in this uh, situation here. So they act on the fiber Hilbert space and should be self-adjoint matrices, which are also coupled with random numbers VN, which for, for instance, could be taken a sequence um, of independent identically distributed random variables in a fixed interval, say. So all this set of these random values makes up one configuration and let's call it disordered configuration. You place them all together in a big space on there, which typically can be chosen to be a, a compact space or will be a compact space in the setup here. And on this space, you have a ZB action uh, with, uh, with respect to which you then get a C star dynamical system. And the other data that we suppose given is and is given here from the distribution of the random variables is that invariant ergodic uh, measure P with respect to that ZD action. Of course, another set, I mean, set of models would falls into this framework would be if you have say quasi-periodic entries VN here. So the first basic quantity that one looks in for these uh, then random operator families, which are also called covariant operator families, because if you shift them with the magnetic translations, you just shift, the, it's the same as shifting the uh, configuration. So the first quantity you look at for these random operators is the integrated density of states, where you just count the number of eigenvalues of finite volume restrictions on a volume lambda, which are uh, less than the energy. And uh, you divide by the, uh, the volume and you can then show that you can take the limit, uh, the thermodynamic limit, and get a quantity which almost surely um, is well defined and gives you well this integrated density of states, which is an increasing function, obviously, as the energy increases. And in many situations, uh, it's even differentiable to get the local density of states. So in quantum Hall effect, typically, I. So in the quantum Hall effect, typically the density of states looks uh, as plotted here. Um, so quantum Hall effect means two dimension. Let's suppose that we have the Landau operator so that without disorder, you would have the 
Landau bands lying there in energy space, which are infinitely degenerate. But at, as you add this order, in particular, if you push it up to intermediate values, the uh, gaps that you would prior before adding the uh, this order have will fill up with uh, states. And what one expects is that these states in between Landau levels, they are Anson localized. So what does that mean? So that means that the uh, spectrum is presumably almost surely a pure point spectrum. So just eigenvalues, which of course then lies dense, such that on the density of states, everything looks nice and smooth. Um, and um, well, the, the second thing is that the eigenstates corresponding to that are uh, exponentially localized uh, in physical space, which is the lattice here. And more technically, and I'll explain that in a second, is that one has so-called fractional moment bounds on the solvent. Um, another technical way to uh, state this Anderson localization is that one has decaying eigenfunction correlators, and that will also appear a little bit later. So now intuitively, what happens is that these states they, they are all localized in between here. And as you change the number of particles in the system, you basically move in this uh, energy axis here and fill up states, which are all localized, uh, which therefore do not change the conductive properties of the sample. And this ultimately leads to the plateau. So this has been understood, of course, physically for a long time and has also been proved in this one particle framework uh, already by Jean Bilissard and myself. A long time ago. So when it comes to logical insulators, the situation is kind of similar. I mean, the, uh, you would like to have stability of, uh, well, equivalence of the uh, Hall conductance uh, with respect to uh, disorder, also in a regime where the um, system is heavily disordered. And as far as I understand, many of the top logical insulators, they're not very clean, but as soon as you have big bumps uh, somewhere in the sample, you immediately are in this regime that you don't have open gaps anymore. You do have localized states, and one would like to know whether one is in, in a topological space. So any disorder allows you to explore a larger region of phase space in which the models are um, uh, topological. Good. So, so what can one know about this Anderson localization? So in dimension one, these statements that I stated are well known since the 70s already. And in higher dimension, there are two methods on the market. One is Fröhlich Spencer's uh, multi-scale method and later came the fractional moment method. And the fractional moment method is what I will use as a definition for the mobility gap regime. So what one does is one takes the resolvent of these random operators, um, like here, and takes low moments. So S is smaller than one. Uh, and it is then possible to show that these low moments, they are integrable with respect to the disorder. Okay, it's somehow understandable that this, this is true. But the second fact is that if you take off-diagonal matrix elements, these off-diagonal matrix elements fall off exponentially as well. Right? So whenever you have such a behavior here uniformly in an interval delta um, with, so for Z having a real part in this interval delta uh, and uniformly in the imaginary part in particular, we will say that we have a mobility gap regime. So this type of regime can actually be proved and actually by relatively short proofs, one can get that in, in two situations. One is where, that you can prove it for all energies. And uh, that whenever the uh, disorder parameter, so this coupling constant lambda is very large. So basically that boils down to doing a perturbation theory in the kinetic energy, which is then small with respect to the random uh, potential. And the second regime, which is of more interest to topological insulators, um, because uh, it doesn't lead to any, I mean, the first situation I should have said always leads to trivial insulators. While the second one here is more interesting because it allows uh, for non-trivial insulators. So there you have a small lambda, but you have to suppose that the interval delta is um, close to the band edges of the periodic operator. So what I called HB before. There you do, in order to get that, you do perturbation theory in lambda, okay? So unfortunately, the regimes 
which one would need to understand the quantum Hall effect in the middle between Landau bands uh, cannot be attained by these methods. Okay, so it's a large open problem to prove uh, localization estimates, whether it's this one or others in, uh, in other regimes. So not at strong coupling and for more energies. So this is of interest also for topologically insulators. Another open question, which will come up a little bit later, is uh, what happens at pseudo gaps in, um, in semi-metals when you add disorder and does one have um, Anderson localization there or does one not? So it's not known. Even on the physics side, it's not very well. Is there... is some... May I ask a question? I have a question. Sure, uh, so it's very interrupted, but go ahead. Uh, this mobility gap or a definition, what's the motivation for this uh, definition? What is the meaning of the parameter S, for example? And why should one require S to be between zero and one? So, so you see, just think of, okay, it's just so that this makes sense, actually, okay? So the motivation is that if you would have here one over, think of H omega just being a random potential, it could definitely not be, not integrate one over uh, say uh, the random variable, just a real number, uh, minus z, it would diverge as z goes to zero. But if the randomness, if you have a small parameter s, smaller than one, it becomes integrable. So you actually do need this parameter s for technical reasons. It, there would be no chance to prove a bound like this for s uh, larger than one or equal to one. The second thing is that I'll tell you in a second is that actually from this kind of estimate, you get many interesting estimates also on the uh, Fermi projection. Okay, so this is sort of what one gets out of the analysis and which is sufficient to carry on um, with further analysis. Including spectral information. In including spectral information, yes. So, okay, even though we can't prove this estimate in many regimes, there are some which we can. Let's do the following. We suppose that it holds, that we have this mobility gap, and we ask, what can we do? So this is a little bit like you guys with interesting system. You suppose you have an open gap, and then you go on. Yeah. So what one thing that we can do on the mathematical side is that we can show, let me go all the way down here first, is that the Fermi projection for energy lying such, in such an interval with a mobility gap uh, has some uh, decay properties, namely it lies in a so-called uh, non-commutative Sobolev space. So I want to explain you what this non-commutative Sobolev space actually is, okay? Um, so let's, let's go through the construction, which for the mathematicians are, uh, are standard. Uh, you have this uh, C star random, uh, C star dynamical system, you have a C star algebra, um, is given by a twisted cross product with a magnetic field. We have covariant representations. Uh, we have unbounded derivations, which are given by the position operators, which in the physical language of periodic operators, which be, would be deriv derivations with respect to quasi-momenta. With respect to these derivations, you have differentiable elements. Yeah. Uh, so being n times differentiable is a condition on the covariant operators to have a sufficient decay of the diagonal. The next thing that one has is this probability measure P, which provides us a tracial state on the algebra A up here, um, which is the trace per unit volume um, given by this formula, which was already in Nigel Hickson's uh, talk, in a reduced in, in a more particular framework. And once you have that, you can go on and construct uh, von Neumann algebra of observables by going into the gene rest representation of this tau and close it uh, with respect to weak topologies. Actually, there are several ways to construct that. But once you, once you have this von Neumann algebra, well, it also comes with an extension of the trace, which is then a semi-finite, actually here is a finite trace. And then you have non-commutative uh, um, non LP spaces by just taking the closure of the differentiable elements with respect to, uh, or the C star algebra elements with respect to uh, the LP norm. And uh, the Sobolev spaces are defined by asking the, uh, by, by taking the closure of the differentiable elements. So 
the nth Sybolev spaces with weight p is taking the nth differentiable elements and closing and, and asking that the derivatives are bounded in LP norm. Okay, so it's it's just like in classical analysis. But one thing is missing here, namely there's no uh, Sobolev lemma. So these elements here, these elements in the Sobolev spaces, they are not in the C star algebra anymore. And um, okay, that's just the fact that one has here. Okay, so now we have a connection and now we want to show that once the first projection is in these Sobolev spaces, we can define uh, these weak topological invariants. So there's a little twist to what um, we are used to do here. Namely, usually one would now take the spatial directions uh, of my um, of uh, my lattice that I had before. But what I want to do is here that I, I want to sort of go to arbitrary directions in uh, my physical systems, because in particular, I would like to induce later on edges, which are irrational angles in uh, with respect to the lattice. So mathematically, what we do is we have these derivations, which led to a d-dimensional torus action. And we take a subgroup of this d-dimensional torus, which is generated by well, n directions, let's say given by an orthonormal system. And then you just uh, let the action run in these uh, n directions. So for example, if n could be just one, you would go into one direction in, uh, in, in, uh, in space only. Okay, and also, of course, for this now Rn action, it could reduce if the angle if these here are rationally uh, related, it could be reduced to a torus action of dimension n. But let's suppose it's an Rn action, it got extended to an Rn n action. These also have derivations. Okay, they're just given by linear combinations of the derivations up here, and then we have therefore uh, an, an Rn action, which leaves uh, the tracial state invariant can define uh, Chunko cycles exactly as Nigel's talk. So uh, this is the classical con formula. However, uh, it's extended here to elements which are in a Sobolev space where the first derivatives are, in, are lie in the um, LN phase which is exactly what you need in order to make this thing back here finite, because if all these derivatives, there are n of them, are in Ln, uh, uh, Hölder inequality shows you that this thing here is finite, okay? It just makes sense. And we need to go exactly into that regime. Okay, then the normalization constants are as usual. And uh, then you go on also as a Nigel's talk, you define the weak topological in invariance. So uh, by pairing with uh, the Fermi projection, for example, you get the even ones just as before. Um, so what does it depend? Well, it depends on how many directions you chose. So this is encoded in the alpha. And uh, th that's the main ingredient, OK? And if the Hamiltonian is chiral, you can use the, uh, the fact that the Fermi projection uh, is expressed in terms of a unitary, the Fermi unitary, then you compute the invariant uh, by this formula. Okay? So what kind of properties hold now that we are in a larger framework, not anymore in a C-star framework? Well, as usual, these uh, invariants, they're uh, constant uh, with respect to the norm topology. Um, that's not very helpful. We will actually are more interested later on in using paths which are also only strongly continuous. But okay, and before saying more to that, let me uh, stress the one-dimensional uh, example, which we will deal with a little bit later. Um, so there you just have one, one uh, chose just one direction and you have one action, uh, which typically we will choose to be an irrational uh, direction. And uh, this will be, allow us to later on model spaces, uh, half spaces in an irrational direction. And then these, uh, if the Hamiltonian is chiral, uh, with respect to this one derivative, you can look at the weak winding number. So it's simply given by this formula here. Okay, this weak winding number is what we'll enter in uh, one of the theorems later on. But before doing that, uh, I can now go on and explain the uh, 
base of index theorem. And for that, I need a little bit more constructions. Uh, namely, we need to go um, from the, uh, we need to construct the cross product with respect to this action alpha. So you take a W star cross product and actually it comes inherits automatically uh, a semi-finite trace, which then will not be a finite trace typically anymore, okay? So this is a bit complicated. Actually, we had uh, to learn quite a lot in order to do that rigorously, but I think it's relatively standard to the experts how to do that. So there's several ways to construct this um, W star cross product um, in, in the regular representation typically this, this is done, okay? What is important, is that uh, the W star cross product, um, well, as bounded rel functions from the shifts in the Rn here. And um, I do, uh, well, I, I have functions of these uh, generators here, which are the generators of the shift on the Rn uh, in the general representations uh, available inside of that algebra. Okay, once you have this, for Neumann cross product algebra and the semi-finite trace, there are again LP spaces, okay? And uh, what we will now also have to do is that we need um, <clears throat> to um, build one operator out of all these uh, derivations up here by uh, building a Dirac operator by taking a Clifford algebra representation with N generators, okay? You build one, uh, Dirac operator. From this one Dirac operator, there is associated a so-called Hardy projection on the positive spectral subspace. So the main example uh, for the application afterwards is n equal to one, where the alpha is just given by the direction, then this cross product here uh, should be thought of as an algebra, an edge algebra, and the trace that you construct up here, um, the trace hat, uh, is a trace per unit volume along the boundary, okay? And in the physical representation, this projection pi here will then be the projection onto the half space as promised before, okay? okay. Question. So the base of index theorem is all, looks just as the index theorem before, um, in some sense, but uh, well, there are lots of interesting uh, comments and uh, conclusions also. So we start out with this semi-finite von Neumann algebra and uh, Rn action alpha being tau invariant, which is a bit more general than before. We have these generators, we get these churn numbers, and the statement is that these churn numbers uh, are given by Fredholm indices in the sense of Breuer, namely, you take the Hardy projection, and here is the odd case, the unitary. You 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 take uh, you squeeze it, and I mean you project down to the Hardy space. And this is a Fredholm operator in the sense that its kernel and its co-kernel have finite trace with respect to this trace per unit volume along the boundary. Okay. Uh, so this is the odd case. Uh, there's also an even case. So what I went over, and which is the important part, is that in the hypothesis, we really only need that the churn call cycles are well defined, um, so that uh, you're in this Sobolev space W1n, and in a uh, Sobolev space which is just a tiny little bit uh, has a tiny little bit more integrability. Okay. So now. Um, what, what is important here is that uh, we, other than in prior theorems, we do not assume that the uh, symbol, so which is here the, uh, un the Fermi unitary, is differentiable, uh, but it li only lies in uh, the Sobolev space. And actually, we need a little bit less, namely, we need only these Besov spaces, which is why it's called Besov index theorem. Uh, but the Besov spaces are in tight connection with uh, the Sobolev spaces. So you can re replace this Besov condition by just the Sobolev condition for the um, purpose of this talk. Okay, so another thing is that the values of these pairings, they are now real numbers. They have the stability properties that I said before, but of course they, they don't lie in the image of, um, 
of a K theory class of the C star algebras and takes, and therefore don't take the discrete set of values. So, in the proof of this theorem, the main new thing is these Peller criteria, okay, which I jumped over. Okay, so what are the stability properties that are left for these uh, indices here in the von Neumann framework? Well, first of all, uh, they are stable with respect to tau hat compact perturbations and with respect to norm continuous paths. This sort of comes uh, uh, out of the general formalism, but um, uh, the norm continuous paths, they are usually not of great interest. Namely, what one really would like is one would like to change the parameter and uh, one would change, like to change the parameters of the system. So say the Hamiltonian in a continuous way. And as the Fermi projection now does not have a gap, this only leads to a strongly continuous path of uh, Fermi projections. Um, so uh, therefore, um, well, it's of interest to look what happens with these pairings and the First result on that is that whenever the associated Fermi projections, they are uniformly bounded in these Sobolev norms, um, then also the values of these pairings vary continuously. So you might say this is not very interesting, but it's not, I mean, if, if of course the, or let me say make two, two comments. I mean, if the index pairing is integer values, this implies that the integer value is constant. So this is what one recovers for the strong variance. While for the, if you take, say, the zeroth germ number, which corresponds to the density of states, um, you will just get that the density of states changes continuously with respect to the parameter of um, the, uh, of this, of the Hamiltonian. Yeah, so the par parameter of the Hamiltonian that you look at. So in particular, this case uh, where n is e so where the full uh, the the um, number of uh, um, parameters in the action is equal to the dimension uh, leads to the strong invariance and therefore explains you um, the uh, constancy of the um, all conductance in the integer quantum Hall effect. Okay, so. What else can you do with the weak invariants? So there are two new points, which I think that one can make. The first is that uh, these weak invariants uh, prohibit that you have localization of edge states in a situation where one does have a bulk gap and that strengthens prior results. So the setup is as follows. You take one uh, direction, zeta, which fixes you a half space. Okay, so zeta is perpendicular to this half space. And you restrict the Hamiltonian to this half space and you add maybe a boundary term along the boundary. And then you take an arbitrary action, Rn action, um, alpha as before, generated by, uh, well, n directions, which are all supposed to be perpendicular to um, the um, boundary, so that uh, alpha cross this. Uh, direction of the of the perpendicular to the boundary I give you an Rn plus one action. And then you suppose, if you suppose that this Rn plus one action has non-trivial, non-vanishing weak invariance, so this is a bulk quantity, yeah, you can prove that there's no Anderson localization of the half space operators in an interval delta, which is supposed to be a bulk gap, as I said before, okay? So this is not the mobility gap regime. This is where the bulk Hamiltonian still does have a gap and you fill this gap with states and they cannot Anderson localize. So the Anderson localization is uh, in the way that we concretely prove this is, uh, well, these, you ha cannot have a bounded eigenfunction correlator. So it's this horrible en estimate um, which basically is what is one of the estimates that you also get of, out of the eisenman molchanov method after, after some work, okay? This is our criteria. So this, this result strengthens prior result of Emil and mine in the sense that you only need non-trivial weak invariance to uh, uh, prove that uh, you have uh, no Anderson localization of the surface states, okay? So this was the first application. So now again, my thing doesn't want to move. There we are. 
there we are. So the second are surface states uh, for chiral systems. So this goes towards the um, semi-metals now. So let's suppose first that we have uh, a chiral Hamiltonian. So uh, it's, it's flattened Hamiltonian uh, can be written with the unitary. And uh, let's suppose we restrict it to a half space, uh, just as we did before. We get a half space operator H hat, which also can be, uh, has a polar decomposition. But now the half space operator typically can have a kernel and we are going to be after this kernel. So uh, in this setup here, the Besov uh, index theorem up there stated that the um, churn number, this weak winding number, so the first churn number, is uh, given by the breuer fredholm index of the Fermi unitary restricted to the positive half space. So this is the uh, situation in n equal to one, which is a bit particular in the uh, index theorem because you do not need the Clifford degrees of freedom. So immediately the index theorem connects the weak winding number to a quantity which can be expressed without adding the Clifford degrees of freedom. So, okay, so this is the, the ESO index theorem. So the question is next, uh, we would like to connect this, uh, this uh, restriction of the Fermi unitary um, to something which is a function of the half space operator. But this restriction is not equal to the uh, unitary um, or partial isometry actually, which is there in the sign of H hat, okay? However, one can prove that the difference between these two is uh, a fret uh, uh, is, is a compact operator with one works with respect to this uh, trace. I mean, the semi-finite trace along, which is the trace per unit volume along the boundary. And therefore in this index here, which is stable under tau compact perturbations, I can replace pi uf by uh, this uf up here, obtained by functional calculus of the half space operator. Okay, so how is this Fredholm index, Breuer Fredholm index down here defined? Well, you look at the kernel of u and the kernel of u star, uh, which is connected to the kernel of the sine of h, uh, namely uh, it's Basically, because you take the difference here, the trace of the Pauli matrix sigma three, so a diagonal one minus one times the kernel of the Hamiltonian. And if you work that, if you write that out, it's the trace per unit volume along the boundary of the positive chiral sector of the kernel minus the negative chiral sector of the boundary of the kernel, okay? take the really the kernel of the Hamiltonian on the half space, it gives you a projection pi hat, which commutes because everything is supposed to be chiral with uh, the, the chiral symmetry. So it is a positive chiral sector and a negative chiral sector. And their difference is a trace class and gives you this winding number, okay? Which of course all holds true provided that we know that uh, I can apply the index theorem. So this is, actually, of course, possible in the mobility gap regime, but it's also possible in a situation which one finds in semi-metals, namely where one has a pseudo gap. So um, a pseudo gap means that the density of states, which we had before, where you look at the density of states, I mean, the I mean, you take all states in an interval between minus epsilon and epsilon uh, around the origin, and you suppose that this density as epsilon goes to zero actually decays faster than for an AC measure. And, and it has here an exponent gamma, epsilon to the power gamma, which is larger than one. So that means that the density of states has a dip at the, at this, uh, at the interesting point uh, energy equal to zero. Okay, so this one hypothesis, second is that you have a mobility gap, but we can't verify that. While the, the first condition we can verify. So under that conditions, we can apply the index theorem and we get the formula 
that this weak winding number is equal to the difference between, I mean, to, to the uh, difference between the density of positive chiral states minus the density of negative chiral states. Generically, it's such that uh, one of these densities here vanishes, uh, and then one only has one contribution there. But we can't prove that. So last slide and application then is that you can do this whole thing in dimension two. And, and uh, then the, the corollary is that uh, for periodic chiral Hamiltonians in dimension d equal to two, where one does know that one has Dirac points and therefore pseudo gaps uh, at the Fermi level, they must, these periodic Hamiltonians when restricted to a half space must have edge states um, also for irrational angles. And moreover, uh, you can calculate the density of states of these surface states. Um, and you also um, obtain, so to say, for free from this index approach that this disorder is at least stable with respect to uh, random perturbations along the boundary. Okay. What we cannot include is, um, well, uh, bulk disorder simply because, again, we do not know how to prove that uh, a bulk disorder, which typically is going to fill the pseudo gap, leads to uh, Anderson localization. If we would know that, we could conclude the same uh, statement. So the most prominent example is graphene. So for graphene, one can compute these winding, weak winding numbers explicitly. One turns out to be one third and one is zero. And then you can read off how many edge states there are. And particularly, you can read off that there are more edge states for the zigzag edge than there are for the armchair, which has none. OK. So last comment is that here there's a value one third, which comes out of the explicit computation for the graphene, I mean, the standard graphene model. And that value is not continuous. So if you change on the graphene uh, model uh, a little bit, this value one third will change. And it's not a topological value. OK. Um, and uh, as, as you change the parameters of the model, uh, this weak winding number will change, but accordingly, also the um, density of surface states will vanish. Okay, so what is robust is are not the invariants, but what is robust in this situation is the bulk boundary correspondence, namely, uh, well, there's always the connections between these weak invariants in the semi metals and uh, the density of surface states. Okay. So this is uh, already the end of my talk. I would also have uh, a slide to show you how they look like, these surface states. Here's, uh, here's a model, which is a chiral 2D model, uh, which has 2D rock points. And then you put it in finite volume and you look at these surface states here. There's in the middle, there's such a peak and uh, you can measure the size of the peak approximately and you compare with the weak winding numbers, which you can cause compute numerically to verify that the theorem works nicely. So thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you very much, Herman. <clears throat> so it's uh, 11.43, so we have in principle uh, 16 minutes for, uh, for questions. Okay, so I'll put uh, my view inside you gallery. Have to, if there are any questions, you have to tell me. I basically just see you and me and Bruno. So, yeah, in, in the view, you can change the view to side by side gallery. Gallery. Okay. Yeah. Can, can you go over there, uh, over the example in a little bit more detail, please? The very okay. last example. Very no? last example, yes. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, um, I have, yeah, actually, I have two examples, but I mean, is the graphene Hamiltonian looks like looks like this? It's a, a model on the square lattice, and the Hamiltonian is chiral. It has only off-diagonal entries, and we see there there's just the shift operators in there, shift one and shift two direction. Uh, it models the, oper the tight binding model to next nearest hopping on the hexagon lattice. And if you compute uh, in Fourier space, the energy bands, you can plot them nicely. Uh, they look like this and you get uh, these Dirac points here. There are two of them actually, one here and one there somewhere. And uh, 
the density of states of this will exactly have a pseudo gap. Now, if you take this model here and restrict it to a subspace of so a space of L two of, of of Z two yeah, with an irrational edge in, in particular, you know that must be surface states along this edge, and you can predict well how many, I mean, in, in the chiral sense, how many edge states there are. And, uh, but the previous slide includes- Is that- uh, The previous slide- enough? And I, I can see that there's quite a bit. Huh? The previous slide includes this order, isn't it? Well, um, once again, if, if you have, uh, you, you, if you add this order, bulk disorder to the system, we do not know what happens uh, in the mobility, uh, uh, what happens at the pseudo gap. So what one would generically expect is that this pseudo gap is going to fill up so that afterwards you don't have a pseudo gap anymore. Uh, there will be states like in one dimension, uh, if you have um, SSH uh, model uh, and you go to a critical point and you add disorder, you are going to fill this pseudo gap. But in the previous and, uh, slide, we don't know. Aesthetics. We don't know whether these states in the pseudo gap will be uh, Anderson localized. At least I don't know. Maybe you can do numerics. But if I understood right, there's quite a few articles, um, which uh, in the physics literature, which are uh, saying it should be localized, and others say it should not be localized, and so on. What we can include is that, well, the, the only disorder that you can include rigorously in the theorem is that you have surface disorder along, along the surface, okay? You can have compact terms along the boundary. Yes. Uh, but Herman, can you hear us clearly or? Uh, so yeah, no, it's fine, no, it's fine. Because the, the graph while it goes off, but uh, now it's the, fine. The Hamiltonian you had in the previous slide, there is there is a disorder, uh, 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 on site potential with this disorder. So that you, you showed a slide before with 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 pictures. Yeah, with pictures. In that slide there yeah, was the spectrum in the states. Ah, okay, are... yeah, okay. So the yeah, but um, that's true. I mean, we, numerically, we can check that uh, this relation holds also uh, with this order. Okay. I think people want to see the slide because it was. Yeah, so and you put the slide. <laughs> okay. The problem is that this slide. You mean this slide here? Huh? Yeah, that's right. That's correct. There is a lambda there. Yeah, that's and the there's one. There's a lambda here. So this this plot. So this is a little bit different model. It's the same class as the. Uh, Graphene model, but you see there's no S1, S2 uh, star or so in there, but it's a chiral model which uh, has a non trivial weak invariant and, um, well, has two Dirac points and it has surface states. And indeed, you can add this order. And we did that, add this order here a numeric, to do the numerics, and it, it's stable, but it's not part that is covered by the theorem. If, even if the disorder is weak. Well, even if the disorder is weak, I don't know what happens to the pseudo gap. Can I ask a question? Y yes, please. Uh, you had this value one third and you were saying it's not topological. Is there anything you can say what, what it would be um, invariant under? So. It, it, would it would it change, for instance, if you change the geometry of the uh, graphene? Yeah. So, for example, if I take this model here, yeah, and I change, say, I add uh, terms to the Hamiltonian, other shift terms to the Hamiltonian, so a higher degree polynomial in the in the shifts, this will move these uh, points, the Dirac points, around, and basically, this weak winding number is. Uh, well, can be seen as a, 
as a measure of the distance between the Dirac points when projected into the different directions, okay? Actually, if you look at the winding number in the general theorem that I had there, you look at the distance between the, the two Dirac points uh, from the angle of the, um, from the angle xeta, okay? So if I change the Hamiltonian continuously by adding here other higher terms to the polynomial indeed, I mean, this weak winding number will change, okay? Uh, mm -hmm. However, and, and it might even change that I have uh, say that instead of the two Dirac points, I have four Dirac points, okay, in my model. What is robust is that it always predicts you the density of surface states. Is that okay, Johannes? Yeah, yeah, thank you. So it's in some sense, it's stable in a small neighborhood. No, it's, uh, no, no. Well, okay, I mean, if- Yeah, because this, this I point- I can't add the disorder, but yeah, I can shift the points macroscopically around, yeah. I would like to add, uh, since I am collaborating now with the metamaterial community, so in metamaterials, you can, you can uh, control the disorder inside in the bulk. Um, what you cannot control is the disorder on the boundary. So I think this result is, will be very welcome uh, by, by the community. Okay. So can you see whether there's other questions because Jean has his hand up. Oh, Jean, please. <laughs> yes. Do you hear me? Yeah, hi, Jean. Yes, I hear you. Hi. Uh, I have two remarks. The first one is that the vanishing of the density of states at, uh, at the uh, pseudo gap is, is usually of the form of a square root singularity which means the exponent that you add is actually smaller than one. And, and on your slide, you said it was bigger than one. No, 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 but oh. this is uh, integrated. I had the integrated density of states. It's fine for graphene. Ah, okay, okay. okay. Uh, wait, let me go to the slide. It's the second remark it's, it's the, really is the, that uh, we have uh, examples of certain gaps, uh, for instance, in quasi-crystals. And uh, the problem with localization in this pseudo gap, when, when you have some disorder, uh, is coming from the fact that the green function of the unperturbed system at zero disorder, this green function has not an exponential decay. And therefore, all the techniques that we are used before, uh, like Eisenman, Molchanov, etc., none of them worked. Right. Nevertheless, we have many reasons from evidence from uh, experiment that the the state should be localized in near the pseudo gap. Okay. Now, in quasi-crystal, it also apply because even though quasi-crystal has long range order, there is something called the flip-flop, okay, or phason modes. And these, these usually uh, are filling the gap. They, they, play, they play a role of a disorder. So even in a perfect, the perfect structure for quasi-crystal, you have a, a remnant of disorder. And there are evidence from, uh, from experiment that uh, these states should be localized. So we need, we need techniques to prove that. That's, I, I perfectly agree. That's why I said that uh, it's another regime where the tools that we have available now, at least the ones that I know, don't seem to work. At least nobody has been doing it. I mean, maybe yes. one can go through the eisenman molchanov uh, analysis with weaker knowledge on the decay, the, uh, on the off-diagonal decay. No, I don't, it's not, not sure whether it works. It's usually not sufficient. Uh, 
is uh, Jean, is possible that some derivatives of the of the green function do have better properties? No, because the derivative derivative with respect to what? Uh, maybe commutators with the position or uh, no, 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 no commutator. Oh, it should it be work. worse. It should be worse, yeah. It's uh, worse. Yeah. The, the problem is that, so take, take the Green's function for the Laplacian, okay? Just the normal Laplacian. And you look at what happened at, at the threshold, okay? This Green function as, as a very slow decay in space. Okay, and that's exactly the trouble. So in high dimension, for dimension larger than or equal to three, we can say something. We, we did some work with Erman in the case of uh, Lattice, uh, that was the, uh, when, when we, uh, Ah, what was the name of this theorem? Where was it? So we we we, we studied this uh, the behavior of these green function in great detail, but uh, for the for the condition for the for the for the localization, it's it's not sufficient. Yeah. So, so we need a new idea. We need new ideas there, right. And it's unclear that in two dimension, it should be, it should be localized. In three, probably. Okay. So, so what, yeah. should we take um, a, a break before the next talk? Okay, let's take three minutes break. 